them again. They've been gone for so long. And so he wept out of joy. The, even the Egyptians and all of the Pharaoh's household heard him. Joseph said to his brother Joseph, the one you sold to Egypt, now don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves that you sold me here. Actually, God sent me before you to save lives. We've already had two years of famine in the land, and there are five years left without planting or harvesting. God sent me before you to make sure you'd survive and rescue your lives in this amazing way. You didn't send me here. It was God who made me a father to Pharaoh, a master of his entire household, and a ruler to the land of Egypt. Hurry, go back to your father. Tell him this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me master of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You may live in the land of Goshen. You will be near me, your children, your grandchildren, your flocks, your herds, and everyone with you. I will support you there, so you, your household, and everyone with you won't starve since the famine will still last five years. You and my brother Benjamin have seen with your own eyes that I'm speaking to you. Tell my father about my power in Egypt and everything you've seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. He threw his arms around Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his shoulder. He kissed all of his brothers and wept, embracing them. After that, his brothers were finally able to talk to him. Amen. Amen. So what is that story about? Jacob. What's that? Jacob. It is a bit about Jacob. What else? You want to say? No. No? Okay. <laughs> the brothers. The brothers. It is about the brothers. It's about forgiveness. What had the brothers done that was so wrong? Well, they had said... They wanted the colored coat. They wanted, they wanted the colored coat. They sure did. They were jealous of it, or envious, as we learned last week. They were envious of the, of the colored coat. And so they thrown jo Joseph out, kicked him down to Egypt, but he wound up doing so well that when they came back, he could embrace them. Could he have made fun of them, or could he have denied them anything? Absolutely he could have. We might have even expected it. But he didn't. And instead, he opened his heart to them, let them in, and they all were welcomed in. So it's a beautiful thing. Now, I've got one thing real quick to share to you, share with you as well. You know what this is? A basket. A basket? Yeah. Anybody else? Table. <laughs> this is called a hyperboloid of one sheet. <laughs> Anybody want to repeat that? I can go like a bunch of sheets. You want to try it? No? Okay. It's a hyperbole in one sheet. Now, how is this made? Anybody have any ideas? In one sheet. <laughs> one sheet, yeah, when it's one sheet. And so you got two circles on either end, and then these little lines here, and they're straight lines going from one point to another. But when they're put together, what happens? They curve. So the whole sheet looks like a curve, but it's actually made up of? Straight lines. Individual lines that are straight to make one sheet. And so point to point, it's a straight line, but it makes a curve. And so part of the story of today is that sometimes, if we go directly where we're going, we can still, it still looks like a curve when we see it as all together. But actually, we're still going straight down the path. It's just not where we thought we were going. Does that make any sense? Yes. There we are. And so we can wind up making this beautiful hyperboloid of one sheet. And I promised Mark that I would somehow squeeze this into the message today. So that was the best I could do. <laughs> Mark, by the, Mark and Peggy, by the way, are, along with many people in the congregation, um, somewhere to see, get a view of the 100% eclipse. And hence, we wish them well. Our reading this morning comes from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 15, verses 10 through 28, and can be read uh, in the Pew Bible, page 797. Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when, when they heard what you said? He answered, 
Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left the place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from the region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. For the word of God in scripture. For the word of God among us. For the word of God within us. And thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Well, God, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of all of our hearts be beautiful in your sight, O God, our rock, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. This is one of those texts about Jesus, the last half of that story, that we, we don't really like very much. It's this idea that Jesus encounters a woman that he's just that's asking for his help, pleading for his help, and he ignores her. In our children's bulletin today, there's a great drawing that has Jesus doing this, looking out that way while she is behind him to the side pleading that he would listen to her. It's not in the main drawing, but I think it, it fits the attitude that we've got going on here. You see, what we're missing here is Jesus is on vacation. Did you catch that part? Maybe, maybe you didn't, but you see, after all of this, Jesus has gone out into the... Has, he's, this is, this is coming after the Sermon on the Mount, so Jesus has got the 5,000 people, the 10, 12, 15,000 people, however, however many there were, out there, they've eaten the bread, they've listened to all of his messages, they've heard the Beatitudes, he's gone across the sea, he's walked on the water, he's told Peter all of these great things, he's gone over there, he's healed somebody on the other side of the shore, and you know what? He's just tired. So he goes to Tyre. Come on, that was <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That's grown worthy. He's tired, so he, he he goes to a place that he thinks nobody will recognize him. He goes to a place that's not Jewish. And so he just kind of walks out there and he's thinking, all right, you know, maybe a couple days here and I can be quiet, nobody knows who I am. And as soon as he walks into the town, bang, Lord, help me! Keeps walking. Maybe she, maybe she'll get on here. You know, you can almost kind of see it that way. And she's still pleading, and the disciples chase after him, just like Jesus. Would you tell her to go away? Now, as could be anybody could well point out, why didn't they tell her to go away? But it's just Jesus. Would you tell her to go away? And he just kind of turns to her and says, "Just, I'm not here for you. You're not one of my people." And then he talks to her about. Even the, you know, talks to her about would you feed the children, you know, would you feed the food for the children of Israel to the dogs? Wow. Jesus. What are you doing? See, we're not used to that idea of Jesus. But you see, Jesus.
Jesus is a product of his place and his time. He's a product of Galilee. He's a product of Nazareth. He's a product of his own history where the people that raised him, the people who taught him, the people who have shared their lives with him, saw anyone who was not Jewish as outside the covenant, not worth their time, not worth their effort. And that's because they've been taught that for all of history. And so, whether we like it or not, and cogent for this time in our place in history, in our country, in our own city, Jesus might have been a racist. And we don't like that. But you see, we carry our history with us. As much as James Baldwin said in 1965, when he was reflecting on the state of racism in the U.S., and he wrote this from Paris, history, as, no one, as nearly no one seems to know, is not merely something to be read, and it does not refer merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all we do. It could scarcely be otherwise, since it is to history that we owe our frames of reference, our identities, and our aspirations. Everything that we understand, everything that we are, who we are, how we see the world, how we think we see the world, comes from our history. Now the thing about Baldwin is that he left the U.S. for France at age 24 in 1948, arriving in Paris with $40 in his pocket, seeking a life liberated from the tyranny of racism, not to mention his sexuality as a gay man. He was convinced that leaving Harlem for Paris literally saved his life. Not that he found Paris any less racist. In the 1984 interview, he said the main difference was that in Paris, the ruling class whites left me alone. And that meant that he could write. And he, all he wanted to do was write. And so he fled from a place where racism was so overt, so noisy, so entwined in everything that he did in Harlem of New York for a place that allowed him to just write. It never goes away. Even there, and even with everything that this man wrote, he was focused on race. It inhabited his very being. He carried it with him from the United States to France, and it affected, and he was in dialogue with it the entire time he was there. We are products of our history. It was not until the seventh grade, and I'm going to come up to get a little personal here, and I try not to do that with many sermons, but today I must. It was not until the seventh grade that I stopped being an apologist, a defender of the Confederate South. As a child, I imbibed the casual, heroic tale of the Confederacy, the idea that it was somehow noble, an idea enshrined in many households across the South that trace their roots back, however tenuously, to the southern side of the Civil War. I was convinced that it was not about slavery. I was convinced that I was not a racist. And I was convinced that those who defended it were regretted that institution. They thought, didn't think it was a good thing, but yet it was there. And yet, and yet, even as a young child, I had this romantic view of the plantation that my family once owned. That it must have been a good place, a place that think people were treated equally and well. That's not true. It couldn't be true. And yet, I tried to carry that in me, even as a child. Now, I say this knowing full well, that my parents never really encouraged any of this. They didn't. However, the more pernicious thing is that those viewpoints and those ideas were not seen as harmful either. It was just what it was. It was history, something in the past. It didn't really affect us now. You see, prejudices born of history are changed by the reactions, particularly the reactions of people you trust or care about. The reason that I mention the seventh grade is that that's when a reaction happened 
that changed how I understood my own so-called heritage. Having just been able to start reading in depth, I was exploring much of Civil War history with the enthusiasm of an amateur historian. I studied battles and skirmishes. I sketched drawings of soldiers and generals and colonels and majors and whatever I could, and cannons and ships. I love ships. Turns out I went to the Navy. That part stuck. Ken Burns' The Civil War had not too recently wrapped up on PBS, and I videotaped the entire thing. I was fascinated. But in seventh grade English chat class, things changed. You see, I had taken a red pen and a blue pen, and I had sketched a small little rebel flag, which I had slid down that clear plastic back of the binder of my English class notebook, not thinking much of it, just showing my heritage. Now, during a surprise notebook inspection, which, if anyone has ever seen the inside of my desk or indeed the inside of this pulpit, which collapsed earlier this morning, knows that surprise notebook inspections were never my strength and often were the difference between A and a B for me in uh, various different classes. They know that I didn't like these things, but I pulled my binder out for this English class and the teacher caught a glimpse of this flag on the spine of the binder. It wasn't hidden. That look of horror on her face. Sheer horror at that symbol in her classroom on my binder. Because I was one of the good kids, right? You guys believe that. I was well behaved. I had good manners. She was Jewish, and there was the symbol, <clears throat> right there in her classroom. So I had to start thinking about what that symbol actually meant to people that weren't me. I had to start thinking about why that look of horror was on her face. I threw that notebook out because I couldn't get that little plastic, that little flag out from beneath the sheet, so I just threw it away. Because I realized that something about that symbol caused that. Something about something that I was told was, to was tolerated in my midst caused that. And I say all this because what is happening in our nation, our city, up and down the East Coast to the West Coast, you name it. The statues disappear and people rush into the streets to yell back at those who wave Confederate battle flags and neo-Nazi shields and helmets, is that we are continuing to be products of our history, just as Jesus was a product of his entire inside them. Ours is a history rich in protest and counter-protest. Ours is a history rich in people decrying injustice, yet it is also a history where our racism and our privilege are so deeply entwined as to be nearly inextricable without killing us. No amount of remorse can fix it. No amount of just thinking about it or dialoguing about it can actually change it. You see, the surgical removal, removal of such a history would be too painful for us to even contemplate, and so we move away from it. But it's not impossible. Just as Jesus was accosted for help, something changed in him in that moment and in that encounter. Something changed in him that made it possible, for he responded, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and she kneels before him with that simple plea, calling him up by the title we've come to know him, with that simple plea, Lord, help me. Now, Lord, help me is such a short sentence for the Bible. There's no argument made here. There's no justification made here. It's a simple plea, Lord, help me me. That me is a human being. That me 
is a child of God, that me has enough confidence to say that. And who is she pleading for at that moment? Because we don't know anything about her. We don't know if she's rich, if she's poor. We don't know if she's a widow. We don't know if she never married. We know nothing about her except for the pain that comes across in those words because she's talking and pleading about her daughter, her child, who is in pain. And all she knows is that maybe, just maybe, this, this prophet from a foreign land, this stranger in a strange land, happens to be coming across her city, and maybe, just maybe, he can do something if she just asks, and so she kneels before him, Lord, help me. She addresses the racism, she addresses the privilege, she addresses everything that is inculcated in who Jesus thinks that he is with a personal plea, help me. Me. I'm good enough. And you know what he answers to that? It is not fair to take the children's food, food and throw it to the dogs. You know, if this story ended there, there might not be a church. Because Matthew ends with this commission to the disciples to go out into all the world, go out to the Gentiles, and baptize all the peoples. If this story ended there, without this Gentile Canaanite woman convincing Jesus that those crumbs were equally for her, there might not be a church. This is one of the most important stories in the Bible, and yet it's a text of terror because Jesus is trying to ignore somebody, trying to treat them as a second-class person. But what she tells him, and I want to quote this properly, what she tells him is not a wild-eyed reaction. <clears throat> she doesn't get up and storm up in a huff. She doesn't say anything, but she remains there, and she makes this point. It would have been that even the dogs eat the crumbs from the table. Even the dogs eat the crumbs from the table. Now, we might sit there and say, well, she's, she's allowing herself to be called a dog. Is she that desperate? No, this is a better argument than that. Her point is that there are crumbs on the table. And what are crumbs but food? Her point is that there is food on that table that God had already designated for the dogs in Jesus' metaphor. Her point is that there is food on the table for her and for everyone else. Jesus saw the food on the table as being this clean, neat meal that was only for the people. But what Jesus forgot in that moment is that when you break bread, what happens? Crumbs. crumbs. Have you guys ever watched communion in this church? The crumbs are flying. <laughs> now, there are churches where they, may, they hold their thumb and their forefinger together to make sure the crumbs don't fall. But the point is that those crumbs do fall. And the point is that those crumbs fall for a reason because they remind us that there is more than we think there is. And she is making this point that, Jesus, you're not understanding. There is more food on that table than you think that there is. And that food on that table is for everybody. It's a toehold. It's a toehold argument. It just gets her foot into the door of his privilege, of his identity, of his, of his ideas. And he realizes as he sees that glimmer of light through that slightly open door that she's right. There is food enough on the table for everybody. And that his ministry is not just limited to those who he thinks are at the table, but to those for whom the table belongs the entire world. And it breaks open the gospel. It breaks open the good news. It's why there are churches here. Her <coughs> argument, that wise argument, cracked open. His entire ministry opened it up so that it wasn't just for the people of privilege. It wasn't just for Jewish people there. It was for the world. <clears throat> and it changed everything. They say vacations can change you. Well, 
There you are. It changed the world. There's a lot of work that our churches are going to have to do to address the ways that racism and white supremacy have closed off the opportunities for others in the world. There's a lot that we're all going to have to do to stop seeing our tables as a zero-sum game, and there's just enough pie for the people we know. And we only can share that pie with just those people. Remember that just the fact that there are crumbs means that there's more than you thought. Just the fact that there are crumbs means that there's more for people. And just when you start to share and open up that sharing, just as what happened there on that feeding of the 5,000, as we've talked about before, people start to realize that, hey, I got excess bread. I got excess fish. I, nobody comes out in the desert without food. Are you kidding? They start sharing. And then the table grows. And the table becomes not just that little table that you see, but it gets bigger and bigger and bigger so that all have a seat around it. We have got to confront the ways that we are closing off the world. We have got to confront the ways in which we have closed, how, how this racism gets wrapped up into us and we tolerate it for so long. You see, I didn't grow up thinking I was a racist. I thought I was a pretty well-enlightened kid. But it wasn't until that personal experience of horror made me start to question that identity. We've got to put ourselves in those places where we will encounter that challenge that will allow us to see the world from a different perspective. We have to allow ourselves to be challenged and our comfort zones to be challenged because guess what? If we do it, then it's going to be easy. It took years. That seventh grade experience wasn't an epiphany moment. It took years to develop that. <coughs> and years of realizing that even in my own household, in my own family, even in my own culture, my own understanding, it was so entwined. And you think there's not pain? Look at this. But there's hope. There's hope. There is such an incredible hope. And that's what this story is about. This story is about breaking <coughs> open that which we don't think can be broken open. About breaking open our own racism, our own fear, our own injustices, and waking up to the world around us. Paul Griffin, and I'm stealing this from John Dorhauer, the general minister and president, he quoted this, but I close with this. Paul Griffin in 1999 wrote in, this, in the introduction to his book Seeds of Racism in the Soul of America. <clears throat> the old seeds of racism have been shown to be sprouting bad fruits all across present day America. Even so, many will continue to heap the bulb of the blame for the persistence of racist ideas on rednecks, white supremacists, and political conservatives. While none of these are immune from blame, Racism also continues because the taproot of its early seeds has not yet been cut by white liberals. It's wound into each of us. <coughs> and even if we can acknowledge that even Jesus can change his mind <coughs> about somebody's identity, so too can we, if we just put ourselves in the place where we can do it. I look forward to doing that. The Lord be with you. Amen.